It's Don here from The Board. Thank you for coming along and checking out another one of our videos. Now, in this video, and this may be series of videos, I'm not sure yet because I haven't quite decided how we're going to do this, I want to look at perhaps being able to fix and restore one of my keyboards. Now, the keyboard that I'm talking about is none other than this that's on the table right here in front of me, which is a Philco Magistouch 1. Now this has MX Blues in it. I bought this secondhand on Mech Market uh, a couple of years ago and it was really the first keyboard that I had bought for home use. The first mechanical keyboard that I had actually purchased was my Ducky Legend for work and I then decided I wanted to get one for home use. This was a pretty good deal. It came, it was well packaged and shipped pretty quickly but after a couple of days of use some of the keys started to act up and was behaving a bit flaky and the keys were actually the control key down in this bottom corner. I wasn't quite sure what was going on with it and when I took it apart I saw that there was actually corrosion on the PCB and there was gunk on some of the PCB bits which kind of indicated to me that there might have been a spill. Now through a long process and whatnot you know I found out that the person I'd bought the keyboard from had actually also bought it second hand and so there was really no traceability or accountability but that's you know that's past history eventually this entire control completely failed it, it didn't work at all and so I was a little bit saddened by that fact and disappointed by that fact and I ended up remapping the Windows key to being the control key using Windows key mapper and then I just put a shift over the top of both of them because it fit perfectly and that's how I used the keyboard for a while until I saved up enough money to actually get my Magistouch 2 which is what you see in front of me here that I'm using now. I had actually lent this keyboard to a colleague friend of mine who by education was a electrical engineer and he said that he was going to take a look at it and maybe try and do a trace hop for me. He had this board for a number of months and was too busy, never got around to it, but he did actually take it apart and have a look at the trace damage and then of course promptly lost the screws. So I've managed to get this keyboard back and now that I have a multimeter available with me and as part of that soldering kit from JCAR, uh, I'm hoping that I will be able to maybe do some tests on this and then maybe do a attempt of a repair. So at least right now in this first part, I'm just going to go over having a look at testing the switches as well as maybe getting the cover off it and checking out what it actually looks like as just background to any future work on getting this keyboard restored. So I'm using a very simple website uh, and it's this one. Now I'm just going to turn off the number two because the corner is being blocked. There we go. And it's just keyboardtester.com and their tester and what you do with it is of course you just start mashing keys up the top and it will tell you what keys are working or not so if we just run our way through it you can see uh, for the most part everything seems to be okay hunky dory as we cycle through the uh, various keys around the place now some of these don't light up green because they have duplicates um, and that way it ensures that you do actually have to check all of the other keys to make sure that they're good. Now I'm pressing caps lock right now and you'll see that caps lock is not working at all and the actual caps lock light is also not showing up so let me just switch that off and you'll see the caps lock light is not doing anything. So that's one bad key Oh, back to the, uh, the input over there. My arrow cluster is working. Shift is working. Shift is working. Then we have control. No control on either side. My Windows key is working. The Alt key left. Spacebar. Alt key right, Windows key, select key, and no control. So what we've been able to establish is that my caps lock 
and my control keys do not work on this keyboard, which uh, is a bit unfortunate. All right, let's switch back over again. So that's a nice, quick, easy way to tell if your inputs are at least being picked up by Windows, and it's just a very simple, quick website. So I'm just going to unjack that. Let's get that cable out of the way. And it, I guess at least it's uh, relatively easy to take some of this keyboard apart because it was missing some screws. Uh, let's get this. Do I need to spudge it with something? Maybe I do. Or does it have screws that he's actually put back in? No, it seems like it's just held on by clips somewhere. Surely. Of course, if we hear a really absolutely painful sounding snap, I've probably done something horribly, horribly wrong. I'm pretty sure there's no screws that are still left in this. So it should just come off. Oh, I've managed to pull the cable off. And yeah. There we go. That's come off there. I realize that I may be seeming a bit rough with this at the moment, but uh, some of these plastic tabs uh, hold very well. Hold very well. Oh, come on, you can do it. There we go. All right. And there we go. Okay. So, there's the back. Nothing to see. We'll put that away somewhere. Now we can see the uh, the actual back of the PCB there and the focus isn't very good but I'm just going to get the front plate out of the way so there's the front plate out of the way and let's see if we can get some focus happening am I going to get a focus? is the lighting not very good for this? but what you'll see down here is maybe will it, will it focus? I think we might need some better light. Let's see if I turn the light on and uh, get some better light. There we go. Let's, uh, let's have a look. Am I going to get a better focus? There we go. So you can kind of see there's a bit of damage. Uh, there's a bit of blackening, rusting kind of appearance around that control circuit and around the traces there as well on those pins um, and you can also see that there's been a bit of uh, rust kind of appearing there as well now this is actually after I already sort of tried to get rid of a lot of that gunk and I just used a bit of distilled water that my wife had for ironing purposes and I uh, you know cotton butted it and then dried it whatnot relatively quickly immediately afterwards so, damage that just looks very simple, just like that, is sufficient to cause problems. Now, let's see if I can uh, pull out that multimeter and check if the switches are working. Alright. Now, did I leave the batteries in this or not? So here's the uh, the very cheap multimeter that I got as part of the kit, and I can't remember if I did or not. I did, excellent. All right, so let's go down to just uh, plain old 200 ohms, and let's just test my probes. One, infinite resistance, and we're down to about 0.7 ohms. Yeah, I, I can live with that. Now this might be tricky, but we'll see if I can uh, actually get this to work somehow. 
so there's there's the multimeter so we can still see that it's reading something um, and then that bottom control switch I think should be these two and if we depress it we have activity there we go so we can see that at least the switch is good um, and of course if we just go straight across the pins it should have nothing and then when the key switch is activated just by pressing down on that it goes down to zero now here's the uh, the fun part I guess if we follow this trace around and it's a bit hard without holding it up it goes from here and it wraps all the way around and keeps going over I'm gonna get my head in the way here but it's really the only way that I can follow this easily it's a very thin trace Ooh, I think I'm gonna be losing it uh, I'm glad at least that it's a surface trace one two three four get over here that's one two three four so it should be over here now if I touch the two contact points it appears that trace is broken which is not surprising now if I actually come over to around here will I get any values no okay now the other one so there's that one which that's been pretty badly corroded and uh, that corrosion is is so bad that we're not getting anything between the solder point and the next one over oh if the key switch is pressed then that does get some activity so I probably need to really sit down and work out how this matrix works uh, talking to some people in the know about this earlier on they said if I could map out the actual matrix that is used it can help in figuring out what to bridge and jump I'm hoping though by doing this at least I can identify purely a trace replacement um, rather than trying to remap or rejig it in any other way so if there's a broken trace which I've kind of figured that there is from point to point at least in this circumstance then if I bridge a wire straight across then it might recover that particular circuit now the other one is the caps lock key which was working before so I'm not sure what's degenerated in that sense now so we're just going to go up to caps lock over here I can't really see that there we go so there's the caps lock and uh, if I apply enough pressure across the keyboard is that going to do anything no all right so caps lock is definitely down and there we go so caps lock the switch works um, yeah switch works so there's definitely something not quite right in regards to the circuit for caps lock uh, and it probably might take a little bit of jiggling around now I can see right over here that there's a bit of corrosion happening on that trace as well it's very very minor it's very very slight I would not have thought that was a problem but evidently it might be so the other control is over here now it's got a whole bunch of vias and whatnot but I believe those two points should be the actual uh, switch points between those two there so we're reading nothing on the multimeter and then I'm just going to actuate that oh is that not the ones I'm expecting oh it is okay so there we go so it's now reading correctly um yeah now I'm obviously going to have to do a bit of thinking about this and a bit of work to figure it out but hopefully we're going to be able to do a bit of playing around and whatnot at the end of the day if I'm not successful what does that mean for this board uh, I either kill the PCB completely in my efforts trying to repair it okay it's a little bit sad but I can always turn this into a hand wire I could desolder and salvage all the switches um, yeah there's a couple of different options out there or alternatively I could send it to somebody else who has more knowledge in regards to trying to fix the board 
and of course they'll probably curse me for my poor attempts at fixing it first beforehand and charge me lots of money. Still, at the end of the day, it is a board that is unused that I have lying around and I might as well have a bit of fun and, and hopefully learn something about fixing, desoldering, etc, etc, etc. So that's it for this video. It's just a very quick introduction on uh, showing you at least what can happen, uh, especially if you do have a spill and you don't clean it up, you don't wipe it properly, you will get some of these trace problems, uh, the corrosion of the actual components on your PCB. Plus as well, it's just a, a look at the uh, MJT1. Um, you can see that the actual cable I don't think that was me that taped it. My friend may have retaped it just to keep it in alignment. There's the uh, there's the actual chip over there. We'll just flip it over so you can check it out. Um, and I guess while we're here, let's see if it's gonna come into focus. Come on, come into focus. Hey, will you do it? Will you do it? No, it doesn't doesn't seem to want to play. All right, well. There we go. Philco keyboard control, PCBA revision 1.2, ESD, CST, T, KVD. What is it? Daughter PCBA revision 1.2. So it's a 2010 uh, design on that. And there's the LEDs. Um, and there's a nice and solid plate there as well. So, you know, worst case scenario, I guess uh, I could end up with a steel plate and a hand wide full-size keyboard or something. All right, that's it. That's going to be a wrap for this video. Um, I think to make life a little bit easier, I'll just do it in parts whenever I manage the time and uh, freedom to get around and mucking around trying to bridge these bad solder joints. So just again, uh, in perhaps the better light, you can see the actual rust on the traces over there. Uh, let's see, where is that point that I found before? So there is just that little smidgen right there above my nail where the trace might be bad for the caps lock uh, and then over here you'll be able to see there's a bit of the trace damage there on that joint a um, bit more trace damage over here so whatever it was that was spilt um, it certainly doesn't look good now of course I have no way of seeing how bad the damage may be on the other side of the PCB, which is the plate side. And there's no way for me to tell without desoldering the whole board. But if I'm gonna to go to that effort, well, <laughs> is it worth it? And I can also say that uh, we know that this is a little bit in terms of older tech because you'll see from the side, maybe, if it's gonna uh, come into focus. Well, you come into focus maybe oh there we go there is a diode so there's there's a couple of diodes there on that pcb but you gotta remember this is a uh, 2010 build so what can i say it's it's seven years old um yeah coming up almost seven years old now but switch is still good switch is still good all right that is a wrap so thank you for checking out this part one on hopefully what might be a successful repair of my Philco Magis Touch 1 make sure you do check out the board podcast at www.theboardpodcast.com or our posts on reddit released weekly as well as specials out throughout the week and if you like this video or any of the other videos on this channel please do hit like please do share it with your friends and of course if you haven't already please subscribe at the moment, we have just over 350 subscribers, and we are doing a Movember cap giveaway from the limited edition 2006 range at 400, 500, 600, and 700 subscribers. So keep your eye out for that. And as usual, until next time, happy clacking. So we are back with my attempt to Y jump my Philco Magis Touch 1 keyboard and sadly to say it has been a bit of a failure. Now I know that I said originally in the earlier part of the video that I was probably thinking of doing it as a multi-step video, multi-part video, but it turns out that I'm just gonna put these two 
and smush it together into one and as you're seeing it now. So I had a go at trying to wire jump the PCB in efforts to get the matrix to work. And I did that, but it didn't seem to work. I followed the traces and as you can see here is the remnant of an actual wire jump. The trace jump kind of worked, but then I still couldn't get any actual signal to come through. And I thought about, had there been a possibility of any damage to the actual PCB on the other side of what was on this side? And because it was, you know, the, the switches were soldered in and it's a solid plate, we can't really see what's going on, on the other side. I would have to desolder to check if there was actually any damage. Now, the logic behind that, to me, was fairly sound because it's obvious that some of these points are either componentry or vias. So they go through the PCB and then there's another connection on the other side and it comes back because it's got to jump over the top of traces on this side of the PCB. So I went about trying to desolder. Now I've never done extensive desoldering before so this is, was the first time I desoldered an entire board with uh, a cheap solder sucker that came in that $25 kit that I bought from Jcar the other time and it worked, worked pretty well. Some things that had happened along the way was I actually lifted some pads. Now that's a bit unfortunate because it means I've effectively made this board, well at least for those connections, useless because with the lifted pad the trace is no longer going to work and then I'm going to be bridging with wire jumps anyway. I'm not too broken up about that because I had anticipated the possibility that the PCB wasn't going to be completely fixable and like I said earlier it might turn into a hand wire board or I would just simply salvage the switches. So to show you one of the jumps, not jumps, the, the lifted pads in case you've never actually desoldered or seen it before and it's actually the one that I had problems with in the first place. So the corrosion was actually bad enough that when I desoldered it the entire ring here, that entire piece came clean off. Uh, and that might actually be part of the reason why the trace wasn't working. Um, and there are a couple of other points where I did do that that didn't have as bad corrosion, but in general, I think I did an okay job in desoldering. Um, the most surprising thing about this, because Philco's have, I guess, a reputation for being really well built. This is a MJT1, so it's the first generation of the Magis Touch series. And if the revision date up here is correct, then this is a you know six and a bit year old keyboard. Um, let's see if I can get the, the desktop camera to there we go. So it's 2010 03rd 23, which is it's seven years and a week old right now at least according to that screen print. So it was actually a bit of a surprise to me that after I had managed to desolder um, this PCB on this side, I'm not sure why that's not returning to focus. Let's uh, maybe give it something to try and focus on. Anyway, uh, when I flipped it over, this is what I found. There's no printed circuit board pattern on this side. Now the second thing that I noticed was what is going on here? Now there is some excessively visible heat damage and I can tell you right now I did not create that heat damage. That was definitely not me. I know that I did not leave my iron on for that long uh, for that blackening to occur and you can see the actual remnants of whatever the spill was that I'd mentioned that had potentially caused this damage in the first place is actually all along the inside of this edge. We can see a whole bunch of diodes and interestingly the vias that I talked about aren't printed but they're just wire jumpers. So that was actually really surprising to me. Uh, surprising simply because I didn't think that a quality of this level was going to be so primitive but then thinking about it from a reliability point of view it's actually quite clever because a hard soldered wire jumper is actually more reliable than 
using a printed trace. As we can tell from the fact that, you know, I've managed to burn the pad out on the other side of this PCB. Now, had they replaced the actual trace on this side with hard wire jumpers as well, you're pretty much getting into the same realm of hand wiring a keyboard, but done at a industrial level, which, if you think about it, goes back to exactly how they used to wire things in the very early days, big computers, backplanes, hand wrapping with pins and all of that kind of stuff. So it's kind of cool to see that, and it I would hazard a guess to say it's relatively rare now that you're going to see a board like this where it's going to be, you know, through hole diodes instead of SMD components, as well as just using straight up wire bridge trace jumps. What's cool about seeing this is this is very reminiscent of when I was doing the keycad attempt following uh, the PCB making guide from Rui Kimao because this has the footprints and it's got the key designations and the diode designations just like in that PCB guide. And if I just lift that up, if the camera is going to get into focus, you'll see how there's a K number in each of the boxes and then there's corresponding D numbers above and the silk screen also has the orientation of the diode. Now, I find that really interesting that the diode orientation is also on this because if this was actually machine done, why would you need that silk screen? But would they have hired people to manually solder these diodes? I don't know. It may simply have been a design during uh, the actual PCB creation phase. So, you know, the PCB engineer designing this and, and labeling the silk screen. So when they did their prototypes and they would have been hand soldered that they just chose to leave it on when they got the actual mass manufactured PCBs created. I'm not sure. Who knows? There's all sorts of potential reasons for this. So, and of course over here I've actually taken the controller off um, and it's just sitting somewhere else, the uh, LEDs and, and the USB. So, what does it mean right now? Um, it means effectively this, this is going to be not much use on this. I'm going to spend a lot more time working out the matrix because the wire jumps you know, in weird places, as well as the uh, unusual trace pattern. Well, not unusual, but sorry, let me rephrase that. In the non-linear matrix format that you would expect a hand wire to look like, uh, makes it very difficult, especially because with these solder points, you would have to flip back and forth to determine if it's actually a diode that's jumping or if it's an actual wire jumper as well. But the cool part, I guess, at least, what's left behind is the fact that I now have a steel plate. Uh, it's very heavy, it's very solid, and uh, while I can make it bend and flex, it's it's heavy duty, you know? It's a steel plate, it's 1.6 mil thick, um, and I've got plate mounted switches already in there, in their normal format, um, and you can see here, look at that, check that out. What is going on with that? you can see the reflection, that pattern of whatever that liquid was that might have got inside. Uh, actually thinking about it, that spill, goodness knows if there was current going through it or heat um, that caused that blackening on the PCB. It might have been spill related. Um, mm -mm, yummy. And you can see the residue down here as well that has caused the rust on the actual plate. So yeah, make sure that if you do spill stuff on your keyboard that you do try and clean it and if possible open it up as well um, and get it all out and cleaned and dry so that you're not going to get a repeat like this. But going back to what I was saying, this is in a perfect condition that I could turn this into a hand wire. Now for example I think a Teensy um, microcontroller 2 plus has 25 IO pins in it so then I could do a 12 by 13 grid but I know that uh, I'm going to need a different arrangement, so it's not going to be a straight matrix, because I've got one, two, three, four, five, six rows, which means I've got potentially 19 columns, but we've got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen, sixteen, seventeen, eighteen, nineteen, twenty 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20 rows, so we're going to be out by one, 
But what that does mean though is because um, if you cut that back to 19, is that right? 19 and 6, so if you make that 18 and 6, you might be able to just wiggle some of these in or you could potentially drop off some of the keys that you might not expect to use on a regular basis like, you know, break for example uh, and scroll lock. I've never used break or scroll lock in my life. Uh, <laughs> so losing, you know, maybe two switches if that would help it fit in the matrix somehow, you know, that, that's a possibility. Um, but I have not hand wired yet and if I was going to hand wire I probably wouldn't start with a full size keyboard just saying so while it has been a bit of a fail for me it's been a learning experience uh, I've learned how easy um, and not easy at the same time to desolder easy in the sense of you heat it up solder sucker pop there it goes and also how long to heat it up for to get that right consistency to get all of that drawn up by the solder sucker in one hit rather than having to do it multiple times uh, as well as how easy it is to potentially lift pads if you're not very careful about that uh, and yeah it, it still gives me some resources and something to play with I don't know maybe I could just saw that off there with the old Dremel and then it could turn into a TKL who knows or I could even cut that there and uh, you know turn it into a, a weird home arrow numpad block thing oh. Who knows? World of possibilities. World of possibilities. Anyway, I don't know if this is really a video worthy of a like and a share, but if you did like seeing this and uh, coming along with this journey of doing a, a quick attempt to fix a keyboard that did not work, then please hit like uh, and share it, of course. And if this is the first time that you've actually come across this channel and you have not yet subscribed, I would love to be able to have your support and your subscription. So at the moment we are at 360 subscribers and like I've said in every video over the last couple of weeks, 400, 500, 600 and 700 subscribers, we're going to be doing a Movember keycap giveaway. So thank you very much for coming along. I'm very sorry that I wasn't able to provide you with a more interesting outcome in regards to being able to fix and jump and get this keyboard back up and running. but. Hopefully in the future, we'll be able to see this guy back up and running in, I don't know, some other form. So thank you for coming along. Thank you for checking out this video. And until next time, happy clacking.